All right, welcome everybody to another installment in the ongoing Michael Brooks tribute series, one that I'm extremely excited to get underway. Uh, before doing so, however, I would like to first thank everyone out there for the tremendous response that we've gotten so far to the first handful of roundtables that we've assembled in honor of Michael. Uh, among a few others, uh, we've already done sessions on the future of the left with Cornell West and Slavoj Zizek, left economics with Mark Blythe, Ben Burgess, and Richard Wolf, history on the left with Harvey Kay and Adolf and Tori Reed, uh, and the online left with Anna Kasparian, uh, Wozni Lambre, and Nando Villa. And uh, we'll continue to air a new roundtable every Tuesday evening on the TMBS YouTube channel. Uh, at this point, we have uh, enough of them lined up to run throughout the months of January and February, um, maybe a little beyond. Uh, patrons have been getting access to some of these a few weeks early. I think they've been able to watch seven or eight of them so far. Um, they'll all be made uh, public uh, eventually in the coming weeks. But joining me for today's roundtable, which will be focused on Michael's comedy and comedy on the left more broadly, perhaps, are Sam Cedar, Matt Leck, David Feldman, and Andy Kindler. And Fans of TMBS and the Majority Report will, of course, know all of these guests well, but let me provide a brief introduction to each of them anyway. I'll start with Sam. Sam Cedar is founder and host of the Majority Report with Sam Cedar, a show which Michael, of course, uh, co-hosted for many years. Uh, Sam is also an MSNBC contributor. This is entirely honest. The last time I actually watched MSNBC was when Sam, Sam was when you filled in for Chris uh, Hayes, which I think was back in August. So yeah. it's, been, it's been a while. Uh, and Sam, of course, is also the voice of Hugo on Bob's Burgers. Uh, Matt Leck will probably be best known to this audience as the producer of both TMBS and Majority Report, uh, along with David Griscom one of the integral members of the TMBS crew, of course. Uh, Matt recently launched a new podcast titled uh, Left Reckoning, which if you haven't subscribed to it yet, you should do so and become a patron if you can. Uh, and Matt is also the uh, proprietor of the book podcast Literary Hangover, which uh, I hope to be a guest on in the not too distant uh, future. Hope so too. Uh, David Feldman. Uh, well, in addition to his frequent appearances on TMBS and the Majority Report, viewers and listeners will know him as the host of The David Feldman Show. What? Um, but he's also written for a number of shows, including uh, Dennis Miller Live, Roseanne, um, among others. Uh, and finally, uh, many viewers and listeners will know our fourth panelist, uh, Andy Kindler, from his role as the Majority Report's resident Dennis Miller expert. Are we oh. on the air? Uh, can they see us? They can see us. Yeah, they can oh. see. Yeah. <laughs> so there's audio. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a little taste of that um, shortly. Um, he often frequents Majority Report, um, as David does, on casual Fridays. Um, but you might also know him from roles on um, a number of shows, including Everybody Loves Raymond, Dr. Katz, Marin, uh, and also Bob's Burgers, where he um, is the voice of Mort, the mortician. Wizards of Waverly Place. Wizards of Waverly yeah. Place, yes. I told you to mention that. God and, damn it, does nothing get done the way you ask it for anymore in the fucking Tagalog? <laughs> <laughs> also co-host of the podcast, um, Thought Squirrel. <laughs> okay, now uh, the way we've been doing these roundtables is to start by asking the guests to remember Michael, um, which people have been doing both personally and, and professionally. Um, in particular, um, Alicia and I would like to hear, um, uh, we've been asking for any thoughts or reflections that you might have about, you know, what you believe was Michael's um, greatest or most significant contribution to the left, whether it be with respect to his political vision, his political commentary, or, I mean, especially for this panel, his political humor and, and comedy. Um, so we are going to do that, but we're also going to do something for this panel that we haven't done for any of the other ones, which is that I've pulled together some clips for all of us to watch and react to um, over the course of the next, um, you know, however long we go here. And the first of these clips, it's a set of uh, brief montages that I put together with um, each of you with, with Michael. Um, so uh, Sam, we're gonna start with you, but before I turn things over um, to you, um, we're going to watch 
of this video that I put together. And these, there's no way before we watch any of these, there's no way that these could possibly be exhaustive. Um, there's so many hours, especially of um, Sam, you and, and, and Matt with, um, with Michael. But uh, I just tried to include some moments that I think best capture and encapsulate the, the dynamic between um, all of you and Michael on, on air. So let me hope that I can do this right and share this first one. Sam, this is you and Michael. Although in a lot of these videos, you know, Matt is, <laughs> Matt's giving an assist from, from, uh, from off screen. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now, the host the main host of the majority <laughs> report with Sam. <laughs> are you doing an impersonation of me now? What? I, oh, I'm sorry. I, if for you were doing that on I, purpose. For some reason when I sat here, I just all of a sudden want to go on Twitter. Really as soon as I saw <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, I just immediately worked on my Twitter and on tomorrow's show. That's um, <laughs> all I <laughs> <laughs> I was introducing you. Oh, all right. <laughs> Great. Oh, welcome, Sam. <laughs> what, what do I... <laughs> <laughs> Am I supposed to turn this? No, I don't think you're supposed to okay. turn this. Hi. No, it's fine. Just leave it there. Just leave it there. The show continues to grow significantly, and I appreciate everybody that made it, has made it possible, including, of course, Sam. Oh. Uh, if we can have a genuine... Sorry, I was tweeting. I was tweeting out. And, I know. Uh, just like... I couldn't do it. I want one genuine moment with you. Oh, we can do that. Uh, yeah. Post it. Po oh, Jesus Christ. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> stink. All right. You know what? Sam is actually basically pretty incidental to all of this. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> no, but seriously, thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm very everything. happy the show is doing so well a year in. Um, I think it's, I, I can't imagine you could have anticipated this level of success projecting out 12 months. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to enter a no fucking sellout zone. And uh, joining me uh, via Skype, he's a journalist. He's a guy who's done more to expose the, the corruption at the DNC than practically anybody. He's an independent. Re he's a guy who's also recently, we're going to talk about it in a minute, he's going to get a lot by so called progressives. I call them faux fucking aggressives. They're not. They promote war. AA Seaman is with us from Skype. Hey, AA, thank, thank you for being here. Uh. <laughs> As you know, I'm a journalist and an editor and an author and a radio personality, producer and an auteur, showrunner, a certified public accountant, day laborer, and a homemaker. I also do some search engine optimization and as well as solution coordinator and a content strategist. This is so Experience magistrate. <laughs> uh, joining me uh, by remote, who is at the New Garden. Uh, is, uh, so what's going on uh, over at, uh, at, at uh, the Garden? It's a little disappointing, to be honest. I thought that more people would be here. I thought that <laughs> believe in the hoax. But we're here. We're going to uh, watch some highlight reels later. Yeah, that's great. Uh, but you do realize it would have been uh, not uh, hockey season there. Yeah, that's why you don't play hockey. <laughs> I'm a little slow. All right. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Christmas book. So, um, yeah, we wanted to kind of make a book that showed um, what goes on at the vice president's residence during Christmas, but also kind of helped people to just um, be able to relate to the idea of you know, coming around loved ones during Christmas time and that being more important than gifts and, and mm. getting expensive things. That's great. Yeah. And it's about Christmas. It's about Hanukkah. What is so special mm. about your oh, bun? This was your bun you got now, your You know, this year. is the thing that's really uh, <laughs> disgusting. Why do they have to ruin it by saying Hanukkah? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I think Israel has the, a right to protect what itself from What percentage of Arabs? people <laughs> even celebrate that holiday? Even Fox News feels a need <laughs> to bend over, <laughs> pull off their shorts, <laughs> and 
trying to take it from liberalism in this country. It's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> media because that's really the only way you're going to get a pure Christmas greeting. And, you know, besides us and President Trump, look, Israel <laughs> has a right to defend itself. <laughs> it doesn't even need to hear about Hanukkah all the time. No, it's unbelievable. I, 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 we're inundated, even in a story about the best Christmas ever. They have to bring up Hanukkah. Why does everything that's good have to be ruined? <laughs> uh, political correctness. That's why. Uh, <laughs> 509 area code. Who's this? Uh, where are you calling from? Good afternoon, guys. Hey. This is Anthony from San Juan. <laughs> Anthony from San Juan. Anthony Welcome from San to the Juan. program. What's happening? Yeah, okay. Uh, according to a recent poll from the Gateway Pundit, 75% of liberals are triggered by the use of the term Chinese virus, <laughs> and another 80% are triggered by seeing people go out in public. And, um, According to a poll conducted recently by myself, 100% of liberals can suck my dick. <laughs> awesome. Was, uh, I love it. <laughs> to replace Mike Pence, who's a traitor and probably also a closeted homosexual. <laughs> I would pick Mike Lee. I was Kevin so I, I had to end with that last oh. one because um that was I actually I texted Michael because the impression of John from San Antonio was so good that I thought it was John doing and he's like no it's Ray Gun. But yeah. So Sam, wow. I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um well I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> uh, the, I mean it's interesting to to look back on those, you know, those clips. The that was when i think about michael's comedy the, i don't even think about those clips to be honest with you mm. like where we were playing characters or or doing bits i mean we would i i, I mean i think many people know that during <clears throat> it started on i think it was either april fools or uh a halloween i mean i don't know like he he, he was with the show for eight years and so it must have been like within a year, I think maybe we started to do the Ken, Ken and Ken show basically because we wanted a day off from doing any real work. And we kept saying like, it would be so easy to do a right wing show. And I was like, well, you know, April Fool's, let's just do it. And that way we basically don't have to do any work. And so we would come in and honestly, the, the most amount of thought went into the costumes. That was it. Like we didn't really plan out that much stuff. Like we started to do beats. Maybe we planned it out a little bit more than we would most shows, but um, you know, that moment, like when Reagan called in, I mean, it was not planned. I had no idea what he was going to do. Um, <laughs> and we would not, we would just basically do beats, but that was like, that, that seemed like such a limited, I mean, we did maybe, I guess, maybe 10 of them, 12 of those, yeah. like uh, Ken, Kenny, Ken's over the course of, <laughs> of eight years, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and <laughs> we did, I, I don't know, over the course of eight years, 2,000 shows, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit more. And so, um, like, when I think of the comedy that Michael did uh that that i think you know frankly like i i i couldn't do uh was more around like the characters that he would play just like slip into with his impressions and and not just the impressions themselves but the sort of the the, the satire that was embedded in those impressions uh, I mean, I, when I watch that stuff and I'm laughing and it was fun and it was funny, but like the, the moments when we're going back and forth um, and just riffing on stuff, I think is like, is the stuff that really sticks out for me. Although it's fun to watch that stuff too. Mm -hmm. we've, we've got those, I've got those too. I've got, we've got a lot of the characters. That we'll watch. Can, I, can I just jump in about the lyricism? The, the, the part about Israel having a right to exist, <laughs> just going back and saying that over and over again it, it, uh, 
it's so beautiful and it, it, it's so funny and it's t- perfect political satire. It, it's saying so much. It's, it's so just a, little. It was a, yeah. Yeah. The power of repetition. It, it, it was musical watching that. Yeah. Well, David, actually, that's a pretty good segue. Why don't we watch the <laughs> what I put together here with, uh, with the two of you? Uh, let me pull Dave, this up. Dave is nothing but great segues. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> I don't know where. Didn't they, I introduce where they, you to your wife? Anger coming? Speaking of segues, I introduced you to your wife. She died last night. I know. That's why I was segueing. <laughs> I wanted to bring that up. <laughs> All right. Well, here, let a day go by at least. <laughs> All right. Here we I go. have to, but you. Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here. Joining us now, David Feldman. He's a comedian. Hey, Sam. Hey, Sam. <laughs> you know, I've got to tell you, I've been doing this show for a couple of years now. Yes. Look at that face. It doesn't sound good today. I don't know what it is, Sam. You have a cold? Oh, you bastard. Go ahead. Go. One thing that stands out about the David Feldman show is it's extremely long. <laughs> and thick. It's very long. <laughs> <laughs> it's disgusting. I, I, love I love you, too. All right. I love you, too. Thanks, David. All right. All right. Hey, are we off the air? Because you were so much better than Sam. He's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and completed. Perfect call. <laughs> All right. Are we off the air? Thank you, brother. Okay, <laughs> thank right. you. Back to the Majority Report Casual Friday. Michael Brooks here. <laughs> Joining us now is the host, the illustrious host of the David Feldman Show. Yeah. Hey, hey, so I just have to keep this short because I'm doing Sam Cedar's show today. <laughs> so, uh, oh, wanna, really? So, uh, I'll, but, uh, you know, until they call me, because I'm expecting a call <laughs> from Sam Cedar, so the minute he called, I have to hang up. But I love your, you know, I love your show. So. Yeah, you like the, the I was I, sort of A for effort kind of thing. You. David Feldman, I please, love you, I love you I so love you. much. You're a, I love your show. I love Sam's show, and I love your show, and... I love when you like talk to Professor Richard Wolf and go, so what's the deal with your dad? You ever kick it with them? You still get along with your dad? I love how you probe into their personal life. <laughs> get them to talk about <laughs> their struggles. Like, no, he's doing a fucking Marin bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have Richard Wolf on. I go like, you study Altasir, but who are your guys? <laughs> <laughs> Lenin, man. I tried to read Lenin once after a terrible break. <laughs> I love you, David. I love you, David. Uh, and joining to commiserate with us on this just embarrassing. I mean, first of all, two endorsing two candidates in a sort of pathetic pseudo woke play, totally disrespecting Bernie Sanders, is uh, to to. Help with the catharsis here is David Feldman. He's host of the David Feldman Show, stand-up comedian, writer for any number of people, from Triumph the Insult Comic Dog to Dennis Miller back <laughs> in the time when Dennis Miller was funny, they tell me. Uh, and he's also a huge Bernie bro, major supporter big, of the movement. David Feldman, big, thanks for being here. Big, big Bernie bro. Big, from way back, before you were born. Before, um, you know, I'm a socialist from way back. I... I uh, David Brooks and I belong to the same social <laughs> book, 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 book of the month club uh, before you were born. Oh, okay. David Brooks, big socialist. Yeah. What were you guys reading? I, oh, the uh, Marx, Engels. Uh, I was a red diaper baby. Uh, my parents weren't. My parents weren't uh, communists. I was born with irritable bowel syndrome. Oh, and, uh, oh. that's why I was a red diaper. But listen, I'm pissed off. <laughs> I don't want to make any jokes here. David Feldman, I <laughs> there. See, there we go again. You invite me on the show. It's like the time I did Tucker Carlson. I hate you. It's time I, it's like, this reminds me of the time I did Tucker Carlson, and they caught me stealing a copy of Mein Kampf from the green room. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody finds David Feldman's Latent anti-Semitism and apologies for the insurance industry at the David Feldman Show, which is a fantastic <laughs> podcast you can subscribe to. 
I, I, I love Thomas. doing. I love being an asshole. I just love it. <laughs> I love you, David Feldman. <laughs> David actually is incredibly smart and supports Bernie. David, have an amazing night. Thanks a million. Thank you. I love you. Thank I love you too. Okay, David, floor is yours. You got it half right. You support Bernie. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He he said that you were very smart and you supported Bernie. So I said you, yes. you got it half right. That was the joke. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sorry, buddy. You're really upset. I'm sorry. I'll stop. No, no, no. I'm just. No, uh, no. I've seen this before. <laughs> You've crossed the line with me, Andy. David's David's got to speed it up. He's got a heist to get to. Uh, <laughs> but, hey, but... hey. Some of us weren't born with enough hair. And it takes. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm a protected class. So I got the red lasers in it or. <laughs> <laughs> I have to before I go on camera, I have to do a little touch up work. I understand on my hair transplants. Well, we've got, I've got more extended clips of, of the centrist Feldman bit, as, as I call it, that we can watch later. But um, yeah, David, I just, you know, if you had some thoughts about any of those clips or just every, you know, when you went Well, on the two, the two things that uh, I didn't know about Michael really, I heard about him through Alex Brazell, who, put him on my show through Andy Kindler. Andy Kindler was the one who turned us on to Michael's comedic chops. You were a big uh, supporter of, of Michael's early on. You, you, I'm shaking my head like, you know what? I got it right again. You did. You yeah, did. And the, the, right the other back. thing that I don't know if my ego I'm going to be because I with 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 Sam, I don't know if I could uh, see somebody coming along on my show that talented <laughs> every day. That had to be. Uh, most people couldn't uh, put up with that, you know, having somebody that talented. It's it, it's I'm, I'm being complimentary. I Except should Leno. Up. Leno used to do that. Leno loves to meet <laughs> other people. That's what he told me once. If I can make someone else funny, that's all I care about. No, I mean, it was uh, to recognize his gifts and not uh, want to crush his skull. That's a natural instinct in, <laughs> in this business is you see somebody and you go, this guy's really talented. I have to destroy him. But you didn't do that. Why not? I, mean, I, I didn't want to crush his <laughs> skull, but it wasn't so much. I mean, it wasn't a, a, a function of his talent. I mean, I... I always had it, it was always very difficult for me to integrate my comedy with, with, with the doing the show that I wanted to do. And so mm -hmm. in, in, at one point, I mean, it took a while to, for it to develop, but within like two years, we hit like a three or four year, um, just sort of like glide path where it was just, I, I thought, sort of perfect. And I mean, it wasn't it, you know, club. You like what I love about it is you, you were able to do really great satire, satire, because the audience you had cultivated an audience that was in on the joke, and you didn't have to go generic like Andy Kindler, who can play to you know anybody because he's, he's, he's he was accessible. known as a starker. Yes. Yeah. A star yeah. Hey, uh, David, can you take this all again, but don't do it as casual Hitler. Just do it as <laughs> Oh, hey, wait. Well, okay. These, this is he just, wiped off the mustache. This is too. Oh, this, is too this is too perfect. Speaking of uh, casual Hitler, um, Andy, here's. It is pretty. Excuse me for one second. It it does look like a Hitler. I, You're I not kind of just like finding it. it out now, are you? <laughs> this it's is a, a bad episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Did you would it? you cover every uh, mirror in your apartment? What's going on? <laughs> I trimmed my beard today for this, and I didn't realize God is playing a joke on me that oh, everything God. else is gray <laughs> except. Did you not the, know that? No, I swear to you. What's the difference between a bad episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm and a regular episode <laughs> of Curb Your Enthusiasm? <laughs> hey, 
that episode that episode David's in, the baptism is a good one. Let me fit let me finish. <laughs> that's the kind of show we need to see on television. And that's the kind of a man who could do comedy against a man like Larry David, who deserves where he is and deserves even more success. All right, Andy, wow. we're watch we're gonna watch this. Andy, were you not doing an hour of structured comedic socio political commentary? What, all, what basically, everything I said about my act, she repeated in the article. I have no structure. He has no structure. That's all she did. <laughs> she took my own act and she used it against me. Instead, the set didn't have a clear structure at all. When not discussing the audience lack of laughs, Kindler relied on jokes about Hitler being Jewish, <laughs> having OCD. Now, again, this oh, sounds I, very suspiciously like the strategy you that, take on I, this show, Andy. <laughs> I stopped that for because my, the great John Doerr wrote me uh, a DM, and he said it would be great if she had left the comma out of that sentence because it would have been relied on jokes about Hitler being Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it relied on jokes about Hitler being Jewish and having OCD. <laughs> Why I didn't know he that? did. I, he couldn't touch any dead body he killed. Refused to touch it. <laughs> Could you imagine Hitler's Jewish mom? I know you're killing everybody, but you don't have time to call your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit in the dark. He said Hitler's mother when Hitler turned off her electricity. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mom. I'll try to call you next week. I'm very busy. <laughs> you know, Mel Brooks was uh, in World War II. He fought in Germany, and he was very affected by the Holocaust and everything else. And now his movie that he won an Oscar for the screenplay, if he had written that now, number one, it wouldn't have got made. They wouldn't have made it. And number two, it would be a microaggression. <laughs> all the these producers? people who are so sensitive, the they can't even the uh, delineate satire, which obviously the producers is. They're satirizing things. Oh, it is. They're not Thanks, Bill. maliciously poking fun at anything um, <laughs> other than the fact that wow. you know, such an idiot. If you watch the movie, you know, Sean plays him as an idiot. Okay, um, but I, I'm disturbed because it goes into every part of our lives, and, and now we we can't we don't have freedom of speech anymore because we say something even a harmless jest, then it gets rammed down your throat as you're some kind of racist. <laughs> hey, it's like you go, you go, you go, hey, you Puerto Rican whore, can I ram this down your throat? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to remind people the reason why Bill O'Reilly is talking in his storage closet uh, to Dennis Miller, who may or may not be on the toilet with his iPad, is because Bill O'Reilly was a serial sexual harasser. And so that might have something to do with his complaints at this moment. Now, there's no freedom of speech. You can't get continued to have your company pay off $20 million lawsuits. <laughs> What happened? What happened to America? latte. You want a little bit more vanilla than that? All of a sudden. <laughs> I don't want to talk about Miller. Go ahead. Uh, so, Miller, I'm just giving you an example. Say you go up to a girl at work. You say, hey, would you like a little of Kirkundy County in you? All of a sudden, your free speech is not <laughs> This also shows how out of date Bill O'Reilly is because it's modern Republican media. You don't just call Adolf Hitler an idiot. Okay, <laughs> show a little bit more respect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you guys think he looked a little bit mad when he talked about how they played Hitler as an idiot? Because <laughs> <laughs> well, so, he thinks that Hitler... There was he did it, he was just like, he's an do. idiot. <laughs> what a boron? The Holocaust? Were you a boron? They say he's stupid like he blew something for them. <laughs> you blew it! <laughs> <laughs> you blew you it! Had, you, you blew had, it! You had him in the palm of your hand. <laughs> Get so much credit, Hitler. But the fact is, he was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> You can see why Bill O'Reilly is such a great author with his like that Hitler was an idiot. I, I love the way that someone would, would would watch the first part of the producers and think they really were celebrating Hitler and then write an angry letter. You know? like, who could watch that movie and think, Is this a pro Hitler thing that I'm watching? This is crazy. Oh, we gotta <laughs> hold on for a second. Did you send that to Matt? 
Mm. All right, hold on for a second, ladies and gentlemen. Miller, it set us back 70 years. Uh, folks, uh, Dennis Miller wants you to know he's paying attention to uh, politics that are <laughs> happening. Uh, just yesterday afternoon, uh, when uh, apparently Jeff Flake said that his completely ineffectual critique of whatever Donald Trump has done uh, this week, Dennis Miller responds with, Henceforth, all snowflakes will be known as Jeff Flakes. So it is written. <laughs> I stop, stop. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Mr. Mandela, who came up with snowflake? The snowflake uh, was a, a something that we came up with during the struggle, during apartheid, because what we were doing was objecting to the apartheid regime's practice of safe spaces in the mines. This is really going back to the earliest days of the ANC so struggle. This is not the way I heard the history of it. Well, it's been, it has been distorted by the liberal media, and that's Hollywood <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it's travesty. So, in addition to your love of Islam, why do you want politically correctness to choke comedy? Well, um, the thing is, is that I think that's exaggerated by... I think that that's part of a propaganda movement. At least, Andy, if you are nothing if not honest about your SJW tude, but it is obviously <laughs> your attitude, which is destroying comedy, destroying Western civilization, and going to lead us into a gay Islamic apocalypse. But <laughs> we're running out of time. You have the final wow. round. Well, the thing is, a lot of people don't. I don't. The big Andy Kinder, everyone. Comedy. Thank you for joining <laughs> us on the Mandela Show. You had to find a word. Thank you so you, much. Come on, Mr. Mandela. I am outraged that you would not let me uh, give me a proper form within which, forth which, to respond. Well, you can join us again, perhaps after I get. An estrogen injection from Sam Cedar. <laughs> None of yours is funny, Jerry Seinfeld. It's fine. No more friends for me. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, though, Mr. Mandela. Thank you, Andy. All right, Andy. Andy. Wow. Wow. You know, it's, I'm so glad you used that uh, that clip because the thing is, um, I don't know if anybody notices in that clip how, how much I added with my heavy breathing. <laughs> my unintentional heavy breathing into the phone I was using. And I really remember, I, I really remember being very nervous about, uh, cause I, I really had nothing going into that. I just loved his character so much. So I was just basically listening to it. And I was looking last night, I was looking at a lot of stuff online. And the thing that I never realized was because I didn't see him as much as I started looking at him, you know, I was on the phone with him was like how much he laughed and how much he laughed like from his soul. And I think that is really, the essence of brilliant, uh, any kind of comedy, but political comedy, because he goes into this riff. There's so many people who could do a riff about uh, Nelson Mandela, and it would just sound like you could get so many jokes that would be gratuitous jokes. And with somebody else doing it, you could say, oh, it's gratuitous that he's making these insults about SJWs. But he's doing it because it's rolling around in his mind, and he's rocking with it. I mean, he's just in the moment of it. And I just think that is, when I heard him talk, talk once about spirituality and he, he was like hesitant to use the word, but I can't think of anybody more spiritually, more tied into his essence of what- Oh, I am, I am, I, I think Except I am. Except for da uh, Mr. David I, I Feldman. Think I am. <laughs> and it's sad that David never got the respect that he deserved, <laughs> I am. either in comedy or <laughs> in his political shows. No one listened, <laughs> no one cared. <laughs> when did he die? So I know that's not, all I wanted to say was that, uh, that's not all I wanted to say, I'm sure I'll, but I just, he was truly, and that's why I think he was an amazing impressionist because the great impressionist, well, the great impressionist, I'm Mr. David Fry. <laughs> uh, he, it's not, it, you, you go past the, it's not even a matter of the voice. The voice is yeah. perfect because he's just doing, he's, he's doing it so comfortably and he also uh gets rhythms of jews better than anybody and it's also sacrilege what he's doing yes that, that you know it's it's daring people to challenge him on his morality 
Yeah, so a but, tempo too. The Nelson Mandela is such a <laughs> right. like, he's such a positive, horrible, uh-huh. evil man. Right. Well that that Mandela thing, I don't know if you guys know the the that was a function of Rick Santorum. I of course he talks about that. He talks about that, right? Uh when, yeah, I've got when, that clip, but yeah, I've got a number. There's a few of them. Well, where, yeah, yeah I mean, the, I mean, I could just, I mean, the Rick Santorum went on, it was sometime around the ACA. And it must have been around, I don't know, very early on when Michael joined the show. And uh, we were in the old studio and, and Santorum basically, I think it was maybe on the death of Mandela, basically compared <laughs> their attempts to repeal the ACA to the struggle that Mandela went through. And we just started like, you know, saying like, oh, yeah, of course, you know, Mandela was very anti-ACA. And he just started to do Mandela's voice. I'd never heard him do Mandela's voice before. He just immediately launched into it, I think, if I remember correctly and uh just started doing right-wing mandela there by the time i don't know by 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 last year mandela sometimes he would do mandela doing an impression of a sopranos (laughs) character (laughs) doing an impression of like charles kushner like it was like (laughs) so deep i distinctly remember at least a couple of times on the show just like we're all laughing and i'm just looking over and i just say at one point like it's almost impossible for anyone listening to the show to have any idea of what's going on (laughs) like i don't care how long you've been listening to the show it's like this is so this is so like like a joke upon a joke upon a joke (laughs) that like the first you know maybe you know, we lost people six jokes ago. <laughs> he was the comics. He really was the comics comic. I mean, he, yeah. really, he really did do so many in- inside things or just things about the stuff that he knew. It was just incredible. Yeah, but I mean, so Sam and, and David, to your points, David, about the, the, the sacrilege, Sam, I'm glad that, you know, you explained or gave, you know, the origin there because it's, it's similar with like anti, anti SJW um, MLK, which I have some, um, some clips of, but Mm. oftentimes, you know, these were born out of right wingers trying to appropriate these like Mandela and MLK. And so coming to that without back to David's point about the sacrilege, like coming to that without that context, um, I think that context is, is important for it. And I think that like actually flipping what's what's going on there um ideologically is something that i want to talk about a little bit after we watch um uh, another some of those impressions but i just want to make a quick comment on the in uh, i st- i came to the show in 2015 and the first uh, or started listening to it heavily in 2015 and actually came to it in 2015 later in the fall but i remember the first time i fell in love with the show before i worked with it was when michael <laughs> lost uh ad spots for the like a pbs masterpiece series called indian summer because he was doing his libertarian gandhi impression <laughs> <the ad. laughs> and uh, like that impression like it it it, it we, we did stack them up in complexity but you get everything you need to know from just the phrase libertarian gandhi and i think like that's what <laughs> w- was able to hook people in so much at least that that when i started listening to the show every day because I didn't want to miss anything like that. And, but, and to Andy's point, though, about it just sort of like emanating out of him, like he's not sitting down and writing these things. They, all of these characters, were, they weren't really developed until they were just, they just popped up. Like he didn't like come up, he wasn't sitting at home going like, column A, uh, famous, uh, you know, uh, icons of history who were on the, the, arguably on the left. And then what could they be on the right? It wasn't, it was more just like there was a moment where something happened that just triggered something, triggered in the good way, uh, something in, in him that, uh, that, that had it spill out. And that, you know, to me, that was like, that was sort of peak of what I wanted to have on the show. You know, at at Air America, we had a, there was a network wide writing crew of like 20 people. In fact, Matt, oh, that's just because I have that letter from, um, oh shoot, who's it from? Uh, Whitney Brown, when he was basically, 
you know, uh, you know, confronting the owner of Air America on the day before launch saying like, we have spent, and I don't know if he put the money in there, but they spent like a million dollars with like a writing crew of like 20 guys. And it was, I think almost all guys except for uh, Liz Winstead. And um, they had created all of these pieces that were, that were pr pretty funny, but they were a little bit canned. And there was this sort of like move at Air America to like have the writers come on and write stuff. And for Janine and I, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the world of comedy that we had come out of, we, you know, we didn't, there was something about like actually having it written and sort of plan that took some of the energy out of it, you know, and it's radio, it's different. It's not going to be, you know, you're not editing it and you're not, you're not, you know, uh, writing it and creating jokes like a sitcom or something like this. It's like very much about being in the moment. And that was the thing that, that Michael, I think really did was to be able to, be in the moment and then also come up with stuff that is actually so good. That's well, just very difficult. And yeah, you know, I'm sorry. Well, can we and, try that again. You go. Just and Sam, can you just say it? <laughs> no, don't 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 little, bray on his parade, David. He had a, a moment no, of sincerity. Just, just, just try it again. The same thing. Do can we get another take on that? No, the one well, thing I just was, you finished them. Sam, finish what you were saying. And I was going to say, and the only thing that was different that, that from improv is that like at improv, you're just trying to sort of create that comedy. Right. But right. here, we needed to service something. The, the point of the show is to service something else. And so yes. there was an ability that he had to have the comedy be genuine and in the moment, but also service a political agenda and story that we were telling. And that is just like very, very difficult to do or to find. Well, that's the thing. The thing is like when he says, um, when he talks about it in the other, when the clip about it, he says, you guys were so upset. You were so upset when you were seeing this. And that's the other thing is so if, if you know, and it sounds like a cliche, but if we didn't have comedy, if someone like Michael Brooks didn't have comedy, they probably would have gone crazy. And the fact that he was able to be so upset by whatever you guys were watching, uh, the Santorum thing, that this just came out of him. I think that's, that's, that's how we all kind of get through it, you know? Yeah, I mean, Andy, in, that, in the, the sort of prelude to the, to the, the debate <laughs> that, that you had with, with him as, as right-wing Mandela, where he explains the origin of it. And I mean, Michael says very clearly that it was actually came out of a place of like, you know, melancholy or like depression that we lost you know one of the last great sort of humans on, on earth and so for somebody to um you know it's back to back to david's point about about the sacrilege if you don't understand where where michael was coming from with that to begin with then it'll you know be it'll be lost on you but did he, did he get blowback from people who didn't understand the characters mm. i wouldn't imagine on the majority report he would no i i mean occasionally people would say something but never in a significant degree. It's because it's so clear. Yeah. It's so, it's so am amazing the way it comes out, you know? So well, true. Matt, I actually wanted to ask you because in a lot of the clips, like you'll, we'll see some of these, but um, sometimes you'll, you'll say something and that would, <laughs> and that would get, get Michael going. Like a lot of the impressions are, um, you know, you guys are sort of going back and forth and it's even funnier because you're off screen most of the time. Mm -hmm. But just seeing Michael react in, I mean, Sam too, like in real time, um, you know, maybe you could yeah, say well, that like well, what's, what's, what's Sam, like? what's, what Sam was saying about like the way you, or maybe it was Andy about this is how you process this stuff that like a lot of the riffs we would go on were basically abridged versions of what we did before the show started. Uh, and I mean, that was how we process the news in the morning we'd start we'd, we'd talk about it and then eventually we'd start joking about it and yeah i mean it was i i don't really have anything else to say about it besides that i guess well i've um, got i mean while we're on this i've got i've got a montage of of, of some of these and um let's uh let's watch this um and i'm glad that can I watch it like Dennis Miller listening to Bill O'Reilly? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see if I have the right. I love your Simply Safe commercials, David. Thank you. Sam I mean, got it. Sam gets me. It is nice hey, to you see you. Hey, you get out of my front door. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Feldman for Simply Safe. <laughs> <laughs> David, you're supposed to be like this. You're supposed to turn your camera to fisheye like you're pressing the doorknob <laughs> to see if I'm home. 
get out of here. I can see you. I'm at the gym, but I'll be home soon. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, sorry. All right, here we go. Look, some people think that we only need to uh, target <laughs> suicide bombings a chip. Other people think <laughs> that Sunnis who aren't on the righteous path should be a victim of suicide bombings as well. But look, we can all agree <laughs> that we need to have more suicide bombings. <laughs> we can all get together behind a common goal of restoring the caliphate. And if we don't listen to each other, then the infidels and the great Satan are going to be us. We need to take a pause. Uh, <laughs> more about the commonalities. Hillary's very process oriented. <laughs> I'm like, Set, I'm the heading people are ready, and she's like, no, 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 we need to file the IRS. We need to go through a proper process. It's the only way to get funded. We're sitting there, we're just spitballing. I'm like, look, what if we thought beyond terrorism? What if we had our own caliphate? <laughs> Is that an Aspen Ideas Festival? <laughs> sitting there with Hillary Clinton, David Gergen, he still shows up a lot. Point guy. CNN leadership analyst. So wait a second. Ariana are Huffington. Saying, are you saying that Gergen was also part of the David party? Gergen and Ariana <laughs> Huffington designed a sleep program for all of our petters. Wow. And uh, we were really wow. able to innovate. Wow. Uh, good to be with you, Sam. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, look, uh, look. here's what we're doing with regard to uh, guns. We're, mm -hmm. we're imposing a series of uh, <laughs> sensible measures that everyone can uh, get behind. Greater uh, scrutiny, background checks, greater accountability on the system. I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, psych. You hear that beautiful music in the background, Sam? I do. You hear that gorgeous call to prayer <laughs> of my faith, the Islamic oh faith, the one and true only faith of God, the one and true and only faith of Allah? <laughs> Here's what I'm really doing with the gun. Yeah. White people, I'm about to take all your guns. <laughs> I'm coming for you. The fruit of Islam is ready. We're locked and loaded and ready to bear, baby. <laughs> no more guns. White people are going to have to pray to the only true and living God, the black God of the <laughs> And the bow ties for everybody. You ready for this? Oh, so everybody's got to wear bow ties. And are you saying that um, basically you're outlining guns, everybody? but just for white people? Just for white people. <laughs> See, that's what people got to twist it. Remember I said I respect gun laws? I'm going to over-respect gun laws when it comes to black people. I see what you're saying. Yeah, there's tiered systems. Arabs and black people get a lot of guns. Iranian people get the most guns because Iran, obviously, favorite right. country <laughs> in the world. Uh, Hispanic people are sort of in the middle, so they'll get some. <laughs> uh, and then there's a within the Hispanic. Mexicans, more guns. Puerto Ricans, more guns. Cubans, less guns. Fuck them. Uh, white people, you don't want a grand total of how many guns you get? Uh, yeah. Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> now, hold on for one second. Well, hold on. Stop, stop the music. Let me just <laughs> stop that music. I'm oh, oh, baby. Hold on. What? Let me All right. Can you really do that via executive action? Uh, I can do that via uh, super Islamo action, which is something you don't even know about. <laughs> I didn't really. Super Islamo. I make a public signing statement. There is a secret Quran on the podium. <laughs> oh. And that is Allah's law, which supersedes <laughs> our law. I mean, really, to be honest with you, it's really Iranian law. Where's Salman Rushdie at? <laughs> Someone, needs to get... Wait, Salman. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. <laughs> All right. Well, Final <laughs> year. Psych. <laughs> Just getting insulted on the knees, baby. Stop it. It's okay. Uh, uh, let me be clear. You know, the white race doesn't disappear overnight. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at the, the, the longer trend. Uh, white mortality increasing. <laughs> Fewer white babies uh, uh, being born. Look, 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 the, the devil isn't going back into a cave overnight. <laughs> the arc of history is long, but it bends towards Sharif. <laughs> no. <there's... laughs> All right, I've got. There's ones. Of, Did, well, uh, hang on, hang on. Yeah. Now, that wasn't written. No, no, no. Are you fucking kidding me? <clears throat> Uh, no, I mean, the only explanation I have is really that's what he was like off of Mike, too. You know, yeah. he would do that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, at one point, I realized as we're watching that, like, um, at one point, I can't remember when this was, maybe 2012, 13, 20, uh, yeah, it was 2013. I started doing a daily radio show after the majority report. 
So I would do the majority for 12 to two, and then I would run up town a couple of blocks and do a three to six radio show for about three or four months. And Michael come on on Fridays as Obama. It wasn't quite as uh, uh, Nation of Islam. Incendiary? <laughs> incendiary, but yes. He, I think it took a while for him to get to the nation of full on Nation of Islam, but it was like, it was almost like, it was almost like, you know, you hear right wingers say like, I, 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 I was more or less like on the left. And then people were just really rude to me. And they started saying like, you're racist. And then I was like, well, I should be racist. And, and, and he sort of like, I think his Obama did that. I think that like, as you know, as they were accusing him of being a uh, nation of Islam, he just basically one day said, I'm coming out of the closet. Yeah, it's right. It's sort it's of a, a way, yes. It's offensive. If you showed that to Obama, he'd shit himself. Oh, he'd he shit would, himself. He would, he would think that was hysterical. Uh, I wish you guys had told me about the Obama stuff before the... <laughs> 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 That's how Andy came on the show as the original Obama bot. I mean, a lot of Michael's impressions are really just yes, Andy and conservatives, right? Yeah. Like, that's what the, the, the right wing Mandela thing is too with yep. Sar Santorum. It's the conservative, it's the conservative fantasy. Um, you know, that, you know, what's amazing yeah. though. I hate to interrupt. The thing is amazing. I hated that New York cover. I don't know if you guys, what you thought where they had Obama and his wife dressed up. I just thought it was, I understood what they were trying to do, but it was horrible. And when you hear Michelle Obama go, I guess it's sarcasm. That's but what he's doing is exactly that. He is playing the fantasies of the right wing about what he's doing and showing the absurdity of that and also the absurdity of, of Obama, which I, it hurts me. I mean, are you talking about the New Yorker cover where they had Michelle and Barack yeah. as, as, as I didn't Islamic? like it. I'm not saying I'm not saying because my, my brother drew that and he has an animation finish. deal let me finish okay that's he's... the kind of cartooning that i would like to see i like racist cartooning <laughs> your brother's right okay thank you you're welcome let's uh let's do let's do let's do mandela let's do a little more mandela all of the injustices in the world that could remind me of the struggle against apartheid the delivery of health care <laughs> through a private market mechanism <laughs> could face the same level of injustice and tyranny <laughs> that Americans face by having an inconvenient website. <laughs> so that they are covered in a catastrophic situation. <laughs> we should fight this. But Sam, I am troubled by a lack of seriousness in the GOP field that I see. <laughs> really? All of these candidates are true patriots who clearly would like to save America from the destructive liberal socialist tendencies of President Obama. <laughs> However, I see a lack of seriousness when it comes to foreign policy and family values that is lacking in the field. Really? What is it that you uh, feel is lacking specifically? I think, as I say, uh, a measure of seriousness when it came to foreign policy and a willingness to confront <laughs> the Islamic threat. See, many people don't recognize, Sam, that there is evil in the world. <laughs> no, I think people, yeah, I think that's probably And I think true. if you look at my you don't think that the Republican experience set and skills that I bring to the table, <laughs> As so I wait continue, a second. Are you suggesting that uh, you, I know right that, wing Nelson Mandela, are going to run for the Republican primary nomination? I know that liberal hosts like to interrupt and be disrespectful. Make <laughs> <laughs> it into a corner. Comments I made about Buju Banton being correct about gay people will be distorted. <laughs> All sorts of things will come my way. But. I have received a message from God <laughs> saying that I must run. So God So is it is today that I am announcing later <laughs> that I will formally create an exploratory committee <laughs> to see if a run could be what this country needs to save it from creeping socialism. Wow. An open border and terrorists at our front door who do no longer believe in American strength. It is breaking news. 
right wing Nelson Mandela has announced that later today he will announce that he's going to announce an exploratory committee. An exploratory, that is correct. The Keystone XL pipeline will provide literally thousands of jobs while rewarding our strategic allies, including Canada, in a time when President Obama has gone on an epic apology tour, undermining our security and power. Nothing could be better than rewarding the workers of America, our allies, in fighting terrorism and Russia by approving the Keystone pipeline. Let's do this properly. It makes sense for America. It makes sense for our security. Let's sign this bill. Do it, President Obama. Oh. Oh, I love how you show the picture of Mandela. Like Mandela. <laughs> yeah, real Mandela. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It really is amazing that we never got like people. I don't know. I mean, maybe it was a tribute to uh, how uh, small reach we had with the show, but we never got in much trouble for putting up a picture of Nelson Mandela. And maybe it was also because he had passed away. Uh, but uh, that would have been hard for him to call in. But yeah, I mean, it was. Um, yeah, it was funny. Well, it's not shock jock. That's the thing. You no. guys aren't doing shock jock comedy. You know, he's doing it from his soul. And so that's why it's like, I'm not amazed. I'm not surprised that he didn't. You know, it's so clear what he's doing. Right. That you're just inside of that character, loving it. Sam, you know? do you remember? Is that the was that the the first clip there when he <laughs> talked about you know the apartheid, the struggle for against apartheid was like the um, inconvenient. What, I, was that I the, think was that, that, that the could first have been time? that. I mean. <laughs> That certainly was pretty close. I mean, based upon like the backdrop and the 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 equipment that we had in that office at that time, um, if that wasn't if that wasn't the first time, it was like the second or third. Yeah, and then really quickly, we've got I want to do one of the anti SJW MLK because actually at the end of it, the ooh, two ooh. of you, ref Sam, you and Michael, sort of reference. Um, the origin of these of these characters. It's nice that we live in a country where you don't, don't have to be ashamed of having a Christmas. That's true. Thank hey. you. <laughs> I should hey, also happy. say, you know, like at that time too, one of the things I think that made it a little bit, I don't know, easier was we only had one camera. In fact, I think that, it's, I'm not even sure that that Nelson Mandela thing was actually, the video was live. The audio was live, but we would record the show and then cut it up. I don't think YouTube Live existed at that time. Mm. And I think at one point we were on Justin TV, which ultimately became Twitch, but it, there was an interim period where we didn't have live video, we just had live audio. And so in many respects, that also, I think influenced what we did because we didn't have, you know, from, as an audio experience, you're listening to that and it's just sort of like, you know, it's a very different one than, you know, cutting over to see Michael's talking like yeah. that. You know, at one point after the fact, you like, you like to see him doing it. But initially, I think like the reason why it felt like it was working so well was because the whole experience for people was completely audio. And, yeah. um, and so I think it gave us a certain license and also sort of oriented the show in a way that would have been different if it was if it had been a like a live video show at the time. I mean, I, I've never thought of the Majority Report as a as a YouTube show or as a video show. It's always been a radio show that we then cut up and happened to show on YouTube, sort of like you know, as opposed to. I mean, you know, there's been experiments in putting like a camera in like Howard Stern's uh, studio, and now they 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 do it in others, but as opposed to, you know, like Al Franken's ra TV version of his radio show. Like we, we, we were doing a radio show that just happened to have a video element to it. <laughs> All right, I've got it. <laughs> People are poor because they're lazy slobs. <laughs> so don't have a proper work etiquette. <laughs> I have a dream that one day the Occupy protesters will take a shower and respect their economic and social betters. <laughs> That's what I work for every day. Get off my lawn. Get off of my lawn and buy gold in these times of sweeping socialism. As my friend Rush pointed out, pretty soon you can't even wink at a pretty lady on a subway no more Jesus. without the Muslim police arresting you.
Monday was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and as is the case with almost everything lately, virtually everyone on social media seemed to parse out MLK's words for whatever narrative they're currently <laughs> pushing in our modern times. The one quote I tweeted of his is perhaps his most famous. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their you character. You got it, Dave. I believe this quote to be as relevant now as it was in the early 1960s, but for a whole other set of reasons. Hey, in the 1960s, MLK was fighting for equality under the law and equality of opportunity, two things that we should all absolutely believe in. Today, those who judge people by the color of their skin and not the content of their character are fighting not for equality, but for special treatment of some at the exclusion of others. This misguided principle, thinking you should treat someone differently because of their skin color, or thinking someone should believe what you think they should believe because of their skin color or any other immutable characteristic, is the essence of prejudice, which means to prejudge. Oh, wow, this prejudge, is I get it. the reverse of what MLK stood for, and sadly, this way of thinking has... Pause it, wait a second, you say, what, this is the what that MLK stood for? Don't prejudge. Pre that's a great. That's a great fucking point. Prejudice comes from prejudge. <laughs> Don't do that. Do that. Two that was, words that was the point of the letter from Alabama from the Birmingham jail. <laughs> and now these SJWs on campus won't engage in a free exchange of ideas when they're not busy killing I hear, arrows. I hear. It's just like Dave Rubin said. There aren't an open exchange of ideas anymore. Martin Luther King. The idea that, that people would be working for the greater good would be so repugnant to him. And as we all know, as we stand here today in the march of glory, <laughs> that acting for the greater good is antithetical to the very enterprise of human life. <laughs> An enterprise that is, in fact, enterprise. <laughs> You're using Twitter because someone had an ingenious idea and pursued their self-interest. And now we all get much more easy to access pornography. <laughs> but some people think socialism is cool. I we'll mean, ask Venezuela how they think about that. Uh, you know, the hearts and minds of the American people today are thinking a lot about it being the weekend where we remember the life and work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But one of my favorite oh. quotes from Dr. King was, now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. You think of how he changed America. He inspired us to change through the legislative process to become a more perfect union. That's exactly what President Trump is calling on the Congress to do. Come to the table in a spirit of good faith. We'll secure our border. We'll reopen the government. And we'll move our nation forward, as the president said yesterday, to even a broader discussion about immigration reform. Lock her up. We all <laughs> that law. <laughs> Mexico will pay. Mexico that is going to pay by the new negotiated NAFTA agreement. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's have the boys from the NCAA and give them some burgers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to to take this like a joke. Nancy Pelosi, more like Nancy MS-13, them borders. <laughs> Am I right, folks? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That's how, uh, that's how uh, right wing Mandela was born, more or less. Like when uh, Rick Santorum. Rick Santorum compared the fight against Obamacare to the struggle against apartheid. <laughs> and that was one of the first times where it was like the only proper answer to this is exactly it. <laughs> Same fucking thing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Sam, those were all happening. That's, that's not scripted, it's all happening real time he's daring you to find that offensive yeah yeah i mean there was there were there were there were things that like matt says like you know we would talk about before the uh, you know in the office and the closest we got to writing was like uh me saying like D you shouldn't say that on there right right yeah. that was <laughs> that was basically <laughs> that was the extent of our writing like that yeah and he goes like no i know and i'm like okay <laughs> it also couldn't have happened without what you were talking about before, without it being radio. That's the thing that's amazing. You know, you're actually sitting there hearing this come out of his, you know, soul or whatever. And yeah. it's like, that makes it so amazing. And I, and I never realized what you were saying before about how 
the format of your show really allowed that. Yeah, and even on TMBS, I was looking at the early weeks of that, and we thought of that as a podcast first. It, basically, because mm-hmm. all the growth was on YouTube, it, it's a YouTube show, um, it, ultimately. But yeah, we thought of it as an audio medium, and then just uh, uh, YouTube was a place to market it. Well, I think, I mean, I think anyone, uh, again, the sort of, uh, it's funny because I, when I show the screen, I can't see the reactions, but I can hear, I can hear everybody. But um, I just wanted to show like a minute of this, of this clip, because anybody who would doubt um, where this was coming from, from, uh, from, from Michael uh, should see this. This is probably, probably like Michael's, like the intellectual, um, like a highlight uh, for him. And this is when he was on a panel at Harvard with, um, with Cornell West in late January. And he's specifically talking about Martin Luther King. And so to David's point about, um, you know, dare, Michael daring you to find that offensive. Uh, I mean, the, the, the bits there with, with the anti-SJW MLK are clearly a response to what we might call I don't know, the Santa Clausification of, of Martin Luther King Jr. And the sort of trotting him out by, by conservative pundits like, um, you know, like Pence was doing there or, or, or Dave Rubin. But I think like, you know, if anyone doubted where this, where this was coming from, I just want to show maybe a minute of this and then we'll, um, I'll lay back on some of the, some of the clips. But um, this is from that, that panel at, uh, at Harvard. I just want to add that thank you. And it's an immense honor to be here including definitely with Dr. West, who is an influence on me. And one of the major reasons that he's an influence on me is because of that synthesis and the ability to hold multiple truths, that we have to have some sense of a capacity here to do something with democracy, and then also not lie and deceive ourselves about what we are and what capitalism is and what empire is. I came across a speech fragment from Martin Luther King Jr. recently, which I played on my show, And I don't know where or the title of the speech, but I thought it was so important because we've put a lot of work and we still have to put work into reminding everybody that the man was on the left. He wasn't a guy who came out once a year and said everybody should treat each other nicely. Mm -hmm. He was a serious... But the other thing that I loved about this speech, which was he talked about the fallacy that certain Christians misunderstood love as a seeding of power. And then Nietzsche came along and rejected Christian morality because he thought it was denying... Uh, someone's vitality, the will to power in a healthy sense. And he said, love without power is sentimental and anemic, and power without love is abusive and corrosive. I'm paraphrasing. And that was when I saw it, I thought, well, here, okay, we know the left-wing Dr. King. Well, here's the Machiavellian Dr. King, and I love it. I want the left to have Machiavelli so that we can have the strategy, the ruthlessness, the clarity to actually win these battles and be ruthless with institutions. And then I want us to learn how to be really kind to each other, welcoming of a broad set, and actually have a movement that has the capacity to do that. That's why the cancel stuff is relevant that Katie brought up, because it's a stand-in for this eliminationism of other humans, which is neoliberalism enacted. And it's also a contradiction from when we get utopian. Wow. I would love to hear that again. He comes back. Yeah, he, I'll, I'll send it to you. He comes back to, to King at the end, but, but very clearly there, I mean, he's, um, you know, wow. pointing out, reminding us that King was somebody from the left <laughs> was, a, uh, and the, this sort of appropriation of him or this sort of anodization, that's not a word, but, um, of him. Um, so you, you showed that as an example of how unfunny Michael can be. Yeah, yeah exactly. The point exactly. that that he, that he was flawed as a comic as well, because that was not <laughs> funny. <laughs> you didn't get that, David. I'm on the. Floor. I would. I didn't hear you laughing. Because I was like this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was. I'd like to see that again. That was. Well, see you on your own time, Feldman. No, Mitchell. sorry. Jesus. I'm sorry. Jesus. I'm getting a little steamed. <laughs> I mean, that that kind of makes me think of something. A lot of these panels have showcased Michael's uh, leftism. And I think, you know, he felt some degree recognized in what he achieved there. He, you know, yeah. got to go and interview Lula. 
I was glad to be on this panel because, you know, to hear you guys call him a comics comic earlier, I think that's something Michael would have really touched Michael to hear because I think it, and people knew he was funny. He knew that people thought he was funny, but I don't think he, I don't think he knew how much people thought he was actually funny. Like, I, think, I, wish, you know, he, I wish he knew that because that would be, I mean, we all go through dark nights of the soul, but there's no, there was nobody funnier than him. I hope he knew that. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I mean, every time we could get you guys on to, on the show, he, he, those were his most, he was so excited to do that sort of stuff. And we kind of moved away. You know, there's this, I remember talking to him about basketball players and rappers, basketball players want to rap and rappers want to play basketball. And I think there's something with leftist podcasters. They all want to be comedians. And then comedians also want to be leftist podcasters a little bit. And when Michael got more confident as the leftist, we stopped doing as much skits and like, because it was extra work, really, <laughs> like writing, like writing the Ben Carson rap took extra time that, you know, and I always thought we'd have more time to do that. And I, I regret that we, you know, weren't able to indulge that side of him a little bit more uh, later on. But uh, yeah, I appreciated. I, I just wanted to reiterate what you guys said earlier, because I think he would have really liked to have heard that. I'm getting a, hang on, a direct message from Andy. Hang on. Don't read it. Don't read what I sent you. <laughs> I, I think it's for Andy's. Uh, don't I'll, read it, David. I'm okay. very upset. Andy said, is this funny? I'm a leftist. I want to be left alone. Is yes, I like that. I like that. <laughs> I, think, I like it's wordplay. Yeah, do like it. Go do it. it. He says, should I do that joke? Yeah. I said, go ahead and do it. You know what I think about being leftist? I'd what? like to be leftist alone for a couple of goddamn days. <laughs> I, I told you. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> you should have just done it. You didn't have to run it by me first. Well, I, uh, you know, you're the you're the linchpin. To Matt's <laughs> point, though, it's really I find it really hard, and I know uh, certainly I've listened to David's show, and I think he definitely finds it hard to maintain both those things simultaneously. <laughs> oh yeah, he could barely continue. to provide like. I mean, uh, it, it's 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 a hard, it's a very hard thing to balance, like to get people. People to, people come to my show from your show, and they say, "I thought you were funny." Well, I don't I mean, know. It's, I go, it's, I do funny on Sam's show. I can't do it on my. It's, it's too hard, hard to do both simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, it's really hard to sort of like yeah. immediately switch gears from like, "Hey, I'm being very earnest about this, and I want to make sure that I get every detail correct." Right, which is essential when you're telling people about the politics of something and to build that trust. And now I want to immediately switch gears to where, like, I'm not going to be so exactly correct, but I'm because I'm really talking about the subtext here and I'm trying to make you laugh. That's a very, I've always had very difficult time doing that on the show. And even frankly, like, you know, uh, through the Air America years and the first couple of years of this podcast, I was still writing comedy scripts. But I, at one point I was like, I can't keep flipping back and forth between. I'm going to say things. something I mean. I'm saying something I mean. Now I'm going to say something I don't mean and hope you realize that I don't it, mean this. And now back to saying something I mean. And it's not only like, is that hard to do, but also just the mindset of like, you know, I'm at my funniest. If you drop me in with like, you know, half a dozen of my comedy friends for a month, I'm going to come out of that. I'm going to be funny because you get into a mode of thinking and, you know, but doing the politics is sort of the, it's a very different mode. And that was one of the things that like, I, I you know, was so, um, it was so like such a, a gift to have Michael on the show because he not only had the ability to do that himself, but he also at, you know, at times would just like serve different roles. And like on some, you know, on Thursdays, he would be doing the whole show, uh, you know, at first to start with Mondays with Matt, but, 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 you know, when, when we would do the show together, you know, we would be in roles in that, in any given moment. And it really, um, I mean, that's why, you know, David, as you said, like, you know, my resent, I, I didn't have that level of resent that comedians have when somebody else is like, wait, people are laughing at him. Cause I was just like, this is we're, we've achieved, you know, part of what I set out to do with, with the majority report was to do basically Howard Stern, but different content. 
Mm. Like that sense of like, you're actually sitting in the studio and you're, there's other people doing, you're just looking around as people are saying stuff that's interesting or funny. And uh, that was really achieved. I mean, one thing I, I sort of miss on this, I don't know if you have clips of it, but him making fun of me. Oh was, yeah. Oh my God. Like, I, oh, the, like sort of the, the, the Mr. Rosenberg voice, the yeah. Sam Brothers. We also called you Samantha Cedar. Yeah. Yes. And that, that, uh, you know, <laughs> was borderline anti-Semitic. Some of the, <laughs> no, it was anti-Semitic, but, <laughs> but it was, but it, it, it really like made the show. I mean, I, I think it made the show funnier, but it made the, the show much more fun to do. Well, and there's an, that there's an example in that right wing Mandela clip earlier where he's talking about <laughs> how we're going to build the wall and he throws in that line about how we're going to pay for it by a renegotiated NAFTA, yeah. which is just like an added political point. Like this is what conservatives are saying to themselves, which is it's like a little educational snippet that rings true that, yep. yeah, it makes it more funnier. Well, I mean, Matt, that's a great point because, I mean, do you, do you guys have time to stick around for one more one more clip? I have no schedule. Hang on, Andy's direct messaging. <laughs> Hang on. David, these are private messages that I was sending you during the podcast not to be read to the other people. He wants to know if this is funny. Should I say I served many roles because I was a waiter at Panera? I don't know. Why don't you <laughs> try it? Don't run these. It's better if it's just spontaneous. When Sam said he served many D roles, David, go ahead, do you I'm have do you do you have time? Right, you need to wait till sundown, anyways, before you go out to do this heist. <laughs> I, you know, you know, David, David sent Leisha and I. I think Sam, you were copied in on it. Uh, an email about he was very upset about these majority report pencils and that he couldn't regift them. And I don't. And then lo and behold. Like a week later, these showed up, and I don't know how to sharpen them. So thanks. You gotta do it with you, like a. Thanks for nothing, for a... David. I also smoked five of those goddamn CBD joints. <laughs> I smoked these. <laughs> I feel are, a I'm smoking thing in the those. lead. Why are we smoking the CBD joints? Okay, are you serious? Because... Well, that's because you have you have a pretty high tolerance. I, have I a want for the, the. But you feel something from that? I'll finish. Oh, I do. Before. I honestly, okay, I do. Well, Matt's I'll the smokables you. expert. Yeah, but I don't get a whole lot from CBD, maybe for the same reason Andy does. I'm not sure. All right. Well, you know, I, I, I did want to say one thing. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt, but that's, uh, you yeah, know, go ahead, I, I, I made a career out of it. No. Uh, what Sam is saying, because Sam is very important, because not very important. It's not important at all. I'm an idiot. But Sam, one time I said on Sam's show, because I feel as a comic that I, uh, and I've learned through therapy, it's a whole long thing, but I learned that whenever I would argue with people online or I would argue with people, anywhere, I was arguing with my father because my father was kind of my hero, but he kind of gave me the idea that- How many he, followers did he have on Twitter? <laughs> but he was smarter than me. And he made me, he didn't mean to, but he made me feel stupid. So when, so, and that's how I would be getting into these arguments on Twitter without realizing you're arguing with your father. But one time I said to Sam, I was doing something, I said self-deprecatingly, I said, uh, I don't know what the fuck, I don't know what I'm talking about. And then you said, Sam, that you actually think I do know what I'm talking about. I just want to say it meant a lot to me that you said that. And I wonder if Michael felt, I mean, I'm wondering, I mean, you created, a, it's a very tough thing to do, politics, comedy. But you created an environment that where that really, where people were able to come out and, and do that. And I just think, you know, it meant a lot to me when you did that. So I, I, I want, meant you know, to tell you I didn't mean that. Oh God damn it! I took it. <laughs> I'm the, so sorry. Oh, I thought God. I had said I was joking. I hate all of you. Uh, well, <laughs> I see I weakness. In, no I, I see weakness and vulnerability, no, I, and I want to seize upon it now. Well, I mean, to to Matt's point about the the, I think Matt, you're referencing the. I forget if it was the MLK thing. Mm -hmm. um and about sort of like and david i thought that this that this happened quite often with the uh the centrist <laughs> character that that you did where you would the comedy sort of strips away the um the the veneer of of these of these positions and actually gets down you know to the ideological bottom of it and i think that's actually what what you and um and Michael, like your comedy, especially the satire had had in common. And so I wanted to show just the sort of like 
brief highlight reel from one of these appearances on uh, it was majority report i think it was it was last december and right. it was before we were about two months away from the first um, primaries and caucuses that context is is important here but i love this clip because um david i told you this i i, I must have watched this about 45 times um in in a row when i was doing the most boring thing ever which was indexing a book and it it kept my it, it, it uh, saved my sanity can but, we get a close-up on kindler as you're saying this <laughs> but uh but this uh <laughs> why is he so hurtful the, he used to be he, fun it was you know he didn't do the hitler thing and he, the, the, the dynamic here i think is is pretty perfect because um sam is playing the the, the straight man and michael when he's not sort of like, well, when occasionally he's lending an, you an assist, David, um, but he's also kind of laughing, you know, hysterically like a hyena throughout, throughout the entirety of the clip. So um, this is just like a condensed version. People should go and, and watch this, this full one if they, they have it. It's, it's titled, Argu Matt, you might've, I don't know if it was you or Brendan who came up with the, who comes up with the titles. It's arguing with a centrist Democrat. Hmm. That? That's not, something like that probably gets you there. Okay. Um, all right, let's 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 watch this. Uh, David, welcome to the program. Hello, hi. I'm always glad to be back. Uh, just a little, a little surprised by the tenor of the, your show today, Sam. Yeah, uh, I'm you, surprised. You mentioned that. Now, do you want to be more specific? Well, you know, a hundred million people stay home on election day right right you know that yeah and i'm not trying to be critical of you but it's this lack of civility <laughs> they're not coming to vote because of shows like yours where you you team up on on good people you know i don't agree with joe biden I, i'm like david brooks you know i'm a socialist from way back <laughs> okay. Did you read David Brooks? Did, Did I you read, read David Brooks today? He, he used to be a socialist. And that means you have bona fides you should be listened to. And I'm an old lefty. Yeah. I'm an old lefty, Sam. Yeah. You know that. I know that. But you're not you're not gonna win beating up on good people like Joe Biden. He's a good man. I don't I have problems with him. I, I you know, in principle I want Bernie. You know that. In right. Principle. <laughs> In principle. What do you mean in principle? We, in principle, we need to listen to the adults and have a civil conversation and not attack Joe Biden because sometimes he tells the truth and sometimes he doesn't. The Democrats, <laughs> this is a party, we're a big tent, Sam. There should be room for facts and lies. <laughs> you, don't, you don't win that way. I mean, go back and watch Franklin Roosevelt's speech. Total focus. Total focus. He says, we're going to fight the Nazis, the Japan. We're, we're leaning in, because that's important, to lean in, because we know our worth. And we're saying, you cannot attack us. And, here, and then he said to the American people, he said to the American people, join me on this rendezvous with destiny, but you have a choice. You have a choice. There's, I'm presenting to you in this speech a, a public option to fight the Nazis. <laughs> you can choose to stay home and, and fight the Nazis in the private sector. And you know what? Because, and this is what you don't understand about Elizabeth Warren. What Roosevelt did is he presented the American people with a choice. They could choose the public option and fight with our army, or they can stay home. And, and fight the, the Nazis, you know, in the private sector <laughs> by, you know, no longer investing in Harron and Brothers and, you know, Ford and Coca-Cola and IBM, the people who were doing business with the Nazis. You could, you know, that's one way to fight the Nazis. Right. But when we saw how well the war was going, I know your your father may be too young, but a lot of Americans opted in for the, the public option and said, you know what, I'm going to go. I'm going to go years fight after, the Nazis. Right? I'm sorry? Two years. At, well, first there was the Roosevelt said, 
there's a public option and, and then about and then in no more no later than three years into my two years into my next term i will present the second phase of the war option yes <laughs> is this michael brooks yes yes i'm helping you out i'm David. surprised you i'm surprised you know something that happened before uh, 1996 <laughs> and you know why do you know what? let me ask you a question because i don't always like your politics i think you're uh, a little brazen do you know why he <laughs> was so successful? I, you know, David, you're going to have to educate me. Because Winston Churchill and Eisenhower, before they stormed the beaches, they told the boys, we have a plan to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> we know how to pay for this. You don't send... We, though, our fathers, or your grandfather, when they stormed the beaches of Anzio... If they weren't certain that all this was going to be paid for, they didn't want to leave you, their grandchildren, <laughs> with intergenerational debt. But, I mean, I got to say, you know, I love Bernie. I do. I'm an old lefty from way back. But I got to say, old lefty from way I got to say, <laughs> I got to say, you know. Yeah, I've actually I've been to Anzio. I'm sorry. It was uh, it was I went You've to, been to where Anzio. Went to Anzio. Anzio. Yeah, I went to Anzio in, it, in Italy. In, in Italy, yeah. yeah. My friend David Waterman. We reenacted uh, his grandfather having his leg blown off uh, with uh, army men, and uh, and they made a little video. Of it sounds like respect. You think that's funny? See, this is you, you think this is funny? Well, you know, <laughs> Bob Dole. Bob Dole lost his black tip felt pen at Anzio. <laughs> And you think that's funny. <laughs> You're making fun of the greatest generation. Okay. But see, this is, this is not how you win in November. No. You, uh, you hate our troops. So, you okay. hate our troops. All right, so just, and this is what I like about Joe Biden, that he knows the middle class was built by unions, and he loves unions, but he's not afraid to take contributions from people who destroy unions. <laughs> <laughs> Big tent. Big tent. So uh, I'm sorry. I just want to see if we could summarize all of this. You're voting for Klobuchar? Yes. <laughs> I, listen, listen, you know, uh, you know, I, too, have a father who's an alcoholic. <laughs> I, I don't know what her policy is, but, you know, when she talked about her father looking for grace and giving up drinking... I thought, I, I like this woman. I, 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 I like her. I like her identity. That's what this country is about, identity. 100%. Well, yes, 100%. Listen, whether you're a man, a woman, a person of shortness, a per I don't care as long as you don't unionize or ask for a <laughs> wage or raise my taxes. But I support everything about you as long as I can keep my money. <laughs> Jesus. And, and I, the, he's, this is everything that we talk. Thank you. <laughs> Distilled the entire modern professional class of Democratic Party and most major media personalities. Thank you for your service. <laughs> yes. David. Well, Thank uh, you, David. David, this has been um, it's been very illuminating, and uh, I think there's a lot of stuff of here, a lot of stuff that we need to uh, think about. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought today, oh and uh, Thank you. maybe <laughs> maybe you know we'll digest this and, and come back with a with a slightly different tone in our show. <laughs> it doesn't you know what it, it compared to it's like you play that after Michael and it it's like little it's like watching a little league game after that's Michael. Not no, no, there's no. Feldman. That is that is incredible comedy right there. That is there's, like driving people crazy comedy. It's yeah, so I mean I mean Sam was saying earlier about the Ken Ken and Ken show that it was like, you know, a, a day off because it's so easy to just be a conservative pundit, but I mean it, it we're it's a year it's a year ago now so a lot of the the actual like immediate context behind that clip is lost but i mean david i don't know if you like was that was that sort of extemporaneous there's a lot there was a lot there like 
four different, four or five different like news stories were in there, like Mayor Pete talking about um, intergenerational debt, like like sort of mimicking the right wing talking points on fiscal, uh, you know, responsibility um, or fiscal conservatism. There was um, uh, the whole bit with uh, with um, fighting the Nazis was a riff on Elizabeth Warren's, uh, you know, Medicare plan, and also maybe Mayor Pete's, you know. I, 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 I wrote it, the but. whole thing out. I put it out yeah. and ch- I wrote the whole thing out before I did it. I, I don't have, I, uh, you can't ad lib is the truth. No, I just, I mean, I, right I, now I, you're trying, right? Uh, uh, See, <laughs> pathetic. Read something, <laughs> read something from your computer right now and get, get I, out of this hole. God, I'm freezing up now. Uh, no, I would write it out and have chunks and then try to steer but i could like when i was watching what sam and michael were doing uh that was what just blew me away is that that, to be truly extemporaneous and to get locked into that character uh who you don't do i mean i do that guy all the time i mean that but anyway no uh it sounds so real that it sounds so that thing is so great about exactly the way it sounds you're not going to win november yeah and and then Michael would when I did it one of the great compliments he would go I fucking hate you because that guy we all know that guy they still exist I mean they they still exist they've taken over the Democratic Party that guy okay that's it I'm gonna do one more fake walkout <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should bring we should have Leisha come on uh, Leisha join us. <clears throat> Hello, hello. But it is, I, 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 um, this is not false humility. Hi, Alicia. It's not false hi. humility. Watching, uh, I'll show you false humility in a second because I'm really great at it. But uh, just watching S- Sam and Michael doing, ex- like doing the Mandela, I mean, just locking into voices that he doesn't do all the time. And it's it just, that's felt so inspired. Listening to that, it, it felt like brick laying, like here's a brick and another brick. And another. Just- you know, it's it's funny you say that, David, because I remember when we had you uh, do a bit for the live show in Brooklyn, Michael and I were so impressed that you wrote everything out and like took the time to actually be deliberate about this stuff. We, It was out of necessity, really. Like that's, Michael can just go yeah. into those voices and yeah, it, sort of interpret the world through using whatever their suggested, you know, vernacular is it's an ability to shut out the world and and i i can't do that i'm so terrified that i i need uh a script <laughs> david i didn't even see was this medication yeah was <laughs> was this one was this david was this when you were the the correspondent you were in uh new uh-huh. hampshire yeah. yeah i didn't even i didn't see you before the show so i didn't even know that you were there i thought you were like calling in and then, and then the end of it, I, I actually recorded something on my phone, but uh, at the end, of, M- Michael was like, I, I see you, David, you're sitting right in the fucking chair. <laughs> <laughs> right, I was reporting from New Hampshire. Reporting right from New Hampshire. Yeah, that was all written out. I, I wrote it out in the dressing room, just, uh, yeah. I, I, I wish I'd written something out right now. <laughs> I've been listening to you guys and, and it's interesting thinking back on like, I don't know, just Michael's humor and how he, like, this is just always innately part of his personality. But one thing that I don't know, might be interesting in all this is, I don't really remember us ever watching the news in our house. Occasionally, he would listen to like NPR. But mostly, I feel like the way he got news as a kid was through stand up comedians, like commenting on the world. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. Alicia, are you aware that you're interrupting Andy Kindler? Yes, that was intentional. <laughs> yeah, usual, I mean, the usual David Feldman. He gets in, he he gets in, and then nobody can continue. That's what he <laughs> who I'll were the comedians in, I'll say that he? To... Alicia, who were the comedians that he um, that he would watch? Did he have any? Prior would be definitely one. Prior I for sure. I bet Eddie he loved Murphy. Andrew Dice Clay. I bet he loved. Yeah, Andrew, Andrew Dice. Dice Clay. I knew um, it. Eddie Murphy in the eight, like old Eddie Murphy from like right. when he was like little, like, like we had VHS tapes of Eddie Murphy on SNL. And he also had a record album of his like really, really early Eddie Murphy stuff. Hmm. Definitely early Dave Chappelle. 
Um, my dad loved Cat Williams. I don't know if that was Michael's person per se, but I remember Cat Williams uh, prior. Th th those are like the primary cornerstones that come to mind for sure. Yeah. Do you like Bill Hicks? Do you know? If you... Yeah, I love Bill Hicks. No, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, he never really talked about Bill Hicks too much. It was, it was prior and Eddie Murphy, really. Yeah. Uh, that was, like, a lot of his comedic personality. And, and he yeah. tended, sorry, I know I'm interrupting someone. Was that? No, 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 you are not. You are not. Uh, okay. Um, he tended to just sort of innately, like, kind of be able to, like, cut to the essence of someone. And it could go either way. Like, I remember I was complaining about a friend. And he just sort of, like, this is so specific, but he's like, oh, do, does he like, is he like rude to waiters? And then if you say something, does he apologize about it for like two hours? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, wow. like that is exactly the vibe. Like he just, I don't, I don't know, had like a, an ability to sort of like get incredibly specific, but that was just sort of like the entire energetic, emotional milieu of, of a character. We were talking yesterday about how he loved Town, which to me was so important <laughs> yeah uh we uh it was interesting um we uh we we listened to come town a lot ba mainly because they did a bit the first we heard of it uh was when they did a jordan peterson impression uh like mm -hmm. a year or so ago and that was really really spot on where it's like actually the, the joke was like jordan peterson's telling his you know uh loser fans that actually being a loser is how you get laid um and I mean, that's what we appreciated about it is they could go and uh, digest that stuff. And, and then, you know, I think maybe one of the best shows we ever did was the show that Stavros from Come Town was on, I think the same show as VJ Prashad, um, the Marxist intellectual. And you have both of those, the interviews existing completely at home in the same, you know, hour and 15 minute span, I think. Yeah, that, we, we commented on that at the time, how impressed we were with ourselves at doing it. It kind of ties into what he was saying with Dr. Cornell West about cancel culture and uh, anyway. Well, I mean, you guys were saying earlier that he really was a comics comic. I mean, uh, that was, it was true among, you know, people in academia because like Sam does and like, like you do, David, I mean, ever you all have, um, you know, academics on your show. And a lot of us aren't, aren't funny, but he was, so, I remember on one of these other tributes um, that uh, Bhaskar Sankara was, was um, hosting and Matt Karp, who's a uh, history professor at Princeton said, I don't remember if it was, I think it was the first time that he met Michael and, and uh, Bhaskar like introduced him to, or Michael just sort of saw them and came up to them because he, he saw Bhaskar and they're like, <laughs> Matt said like, he didn't talk about politics like Michael did like a like a tight five and we were like in stitches and then he just he just left and Matt was like what the fuck just happened I thought this like that was the funniest thing I've ever and um yeah the first time I met Michael like it was like a half an hour of like jokes until we actually started talking about anything serious so it doesn't it doesn't surprise me and then in terms of the cancellation of it all I wondered if as his star rose if that was inevitable because there were definitely characters and bits and sketches that were even more out there from before he started doing it publicly I, what's I the hardest know. he ever made you laugh Leisha, when you were growing up like the heart like where he was, like, i, I have this you. one memory of us like god we were like such fair weather jews but for some reason we went to a synagogue for hanukkah Probably because there was like free lot because I mean, honestly, it was like such a one off. I don't even really <laughs> know why we were there. And there was this like kind of hippie rabbi chick and she was singing like acoustic or not acoustic. We sing with her guitar. Um, OK, acoustic. I thought I th said acapella. Um, something about like turning the darkness into light. And Michael started kind of making fun of her and it got so out of control that we were like crying and like, like kind of like having like all but a seizure. And then I remember we like had to leave and it was like a scene from a movie where everyone was like looking at us and like, and, and he, he stood in the hall and he was just turning the light switch on and off in the hall. And we were like, we like, you know, when you just can't stop. It was like, it was like, it, it was completely uh, game uh, over. So that, that definitely comes, comes to mind. I mean, but, I mean, a lot of it was just like, 
being in a social situation or, you know, like, I feel like lots of times our family table was just everyone talking over each other, interrupting and making jokes kind of just for themselves. And it was very dysfunctional. I don't know. That's like a nice memory of like the comedy being in unity. Um, I don't know. Michael's just neatly funny. I mean, he, uh, it was everything. I don't, I don't know. I mean, he could be like really serious. He also was very quick to say when things weren't funny. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I liked when the, that call you guys got, uh, Sam from the, uh, it was the, somebody doing a Jordan Peterson voice mm -hmm. and it's, it's hilarious, but like right off the bat, Michael, you can hear Michael in the background laughing. And he says, bad voice, good content. Like he just like was <laughs> just judging it live in, in, real, in real time. Um, well, I know David could do another four hours because we're only two hours in, but we should probably, uh, well, this is part of it. This is part of your show today, right, David? Wait, I piped my whole <laughs> life. Is my whole life. Is David's been recording it's this and it's going to yeah. run it for his show. Right. I, I have one last uh, Michael joke. Yeah. We, another, another, there weirdly always came around. Like, I don't know. We would do Passover like once a decade with our, our family, but, um, we were at Passover and my cousins were little. And I remember he kept referring to them as the P Taliban because they were a small terrorist organization. <laughs> <laughs> you know, his, that his kind of knowledge stuff. of of uh, popular culture was pretty vast. It seemed to me. Oh yeah. I may be wrong about it, but it seemed like he knew he was looking at everything. Yeah, he mostly mostly interpersonally like talked about pop culture. For sure. And he probably had deep knowledge of Jews. I can tell that he had deep. The chosen people. Jews. Yes, and he just, the voices are so classic ads. He really our, nailed it. Yeah, our grandparents were kind of like textbook, like stereotypical New York Jews that, you know, that was a big influence on Michael. My grandmother would always just be like, Jews don't have godparents. Jews don't, you know, like she just like would like, there's a lot of definitive things with like what Jews did and didn't do. That like, we're just like the world, court, you know, like, Oh, Jews aren't actresses. Like, <laughs> was it? Judy Garland tried to make it. Oh, no, it wasn't Judy Garland. There was some actress that was trying to make it. She had to wash her socks in the sink. She's like, Leisha, don't be so active. You have to wash your socks in the sink. <laughs> I was like, I think I'll be okay. I mean, if that's the worst thing that happens, I, I think I'll, I'll try. I like how in the, in the right-wing Mandela debate, Andy, the first thing he says is... Oh, Andy Kindler, who is a who is a Jew. <laughs> so good. Yeah, in your response, gee, do you, geez, Mr. Mandela, do you always uh, begin with people's uh, re religion? <laughs> the whole thing is great. People should watch that. But oh, yeah, just know. please ignore my breathing. I think I have one of those breathe phones that the older people use. Consumer cellular. They have a breathe phone. Breathe phone. That's what, that's back when you were still smoking Lucky Strikes, right? You know, Dave, I did send you. Did you see? I sent you a DM. Oh, no. Okay. You, you, Set me up for the cigarette joke. What's the cigarette joke? No, that's the DM you sent him. Oh, no, I said I will destroy you. Oh. <laughs> you, I, well, congratulations, you succeeded. <laughs> well, before we, before we go, let me just, I also, I want to say like um, uh, that, you know, I, that, that I probably have, um, uh, you know, half a dozen people over my career who have been big influences on me, but, but David and Andy are, are two of those guys. I mean, I remember seeing David, uh, more than 25 years ago at catch and, uh, like specific joke. I remember you telling about, about, I think I've mentioned this to you, David, but, uh, the one about, you know, we need more women to be leaders because l women never get into wars <laughs> except for Indira Gandhi and Margaret Thatcher <laughs> and and I and every other woman who's ever led a country you know like, and right. I I mean I remember that that joke from 27 years ago and wow. um I wish I could remember it I I mean I I I, I literally I, I remember you up there and you know at the time I was trying to do some type of political comedy too and it was a big big um influence on me um as to what not to do in that <laughs> and andy uh, you know um i've been a fan of since the, i think the day i met you probably two years after that and um 
uh, the Stacy Papadouski rings in my head in a way that um, very few people could possibly understand even what that means. But um, and it was always a huge it just uh, was so much fun to bring you guys on and to see Michael's reaction to you guys uh, was, you know, I just had a tremendous amount. I was like this, I'm in the catbird seat. Cause I'm just like sort of watching him laugh at you guys. And just sort of like, I get to sort of watch this dynamic. Um, it was just a real treat uh, for me. And, you know, I will, I, I think, as much as I miss uh, Michael's comedy, uh, you know, in, in moments during the course of the show, I think his laugh uh, yeah. is something uh, that I think I, I miss hearing more than anything else on some level. Right. Thank you, Sam. Can I, can I respond to that? I, I think Andy. So, I mean, uh, I think... It, it just, but uh, thank you for introducing me to Michael. I would never would have met him and to be able that intergenerational connection. He 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 would contact me. He would, you know, encourage me. And to have young people uh, rooting for you is, uh, you know, he he, uh, you know, uh, he inspired me. He inspired. I'm being serious here. Uh, he inspired me to be funnier, to work harder on my show and uh, move f further and further to the left and shake off all that neoliberal horseshit that caked up on me as I parented. You know, I wanted to be the adult in the room. I'm a father, I have children. And so you begin to think like the Obamas and the Clintons and you think you're being smart. And he helped me just remove all that stuff and see the bullshit and uh, yeah, I mean, I really feel, I, I know it's unfair to say this in front of Alicia, but he, you know, uh, he, I feel cheated. I, 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 I coming on your show uh, is so much fun because I get to do that character, which I don't get to do anymore. And that with not having Michael, it, it, I, you know, it, uh, I feel cheated because I was just getting into his life. You know, I was just, you know, my daughter had just moved to Brooklyn and I, I, I saw a future that, uh, and uh, so anyway, yeah. I think that's beautiful what you said. And, uh, you know, uh, then don't try to top way. it. Then don't, oh, don't try to top it. Well, I will just like, it. no, I can, okay. I can have one story. You're so competitive. No, no, I just have one anecdote. No, but I mean, he would reach, and the other thing was like, when you say you feel cheated, because just how life is, it's like, Michael would always reach out to me when I was going to New York. It was like- I always heard people. from him. He was such a good friend. He was such he, a I mensch. always heard and, from him. And he really loved the connections he was making. <clears throat> and uh, and I, that's why I feel cheated too, because I, you know, I just always thought I would see him in New York and we would right. hang out and- because he was, had so he much was a better friend than I was. I would always, hey, how you doing? Checking in. How you do? He would always check in on me. I'm sorry, Andy, I interrupted you. No, it's, I, I expect that from you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I mean, thanks, thanks to all of you so much for for joining. I mean, you all already know this, but Michael, Michael loved you all, and um, we could we couldn't do a tribute to Michael without doing, uh, you know, a panel on comedy, and I couldn't think of. Uh, better, better guests, more appropriate guests for it. Um, Mike, I mean, Sam would know far better. Sam and Matt would know far better than me. But anytime David or Andy was going to be on the show, you knew that was going to be, you know, you knew it was going to be a good show, but you also knew that you were going to hear Michael like laugh <laughs> uncontrollably for about 45 minutes or so. So, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. I just want to say real quickly, um, you know, I didn't have the problem where I, I wasn't able to hook up with Michael as much as I wanted to. I, work with him weekly for five years and on Tuesdays a double shift um, on two different projects and it I never got <laughs> I, w I would do that for you know 15 more years it was that enjoyable and uh, yeah I I felt um, lucky to be just uh, forced <laughs> into his company uh, so regularly uh, and uh, it's something I miss all the time.
Um, I, I also think that there is nothing better when you're a, a funny person to have other people understand your humor. Like the way that Matt was like, oh, you know, not only is he making fun of and subverting right wing Mandela, he's also educating us about NAFTA at the same time. The fact that Matt understood that is the biggest like gift you can have because there's really it's not fun being as funny and as smart as Michael was if no one's getting it. So um, the fact that you guys all created this universe with him, it, it wouldn't have mattered if he had just been alone in a in a, a bubble. So, you know, I think we're all just grateful that you guys had this kind of banter between all of you and, and let him kind of just completely rip and, and enjoy each other. And I, I love that you feel cheated, David, because you know, I, it kind of, I, I, I've said this the other day on your show, but when someone you love dies, it feels like the whole world should stop and everyone should feel cheated. And it, it makes me feel less insane. And, and you know, it, it helps to share the pain. Right. I should mention that I always feel cheated. I right, feel right. I knew that. I knew today. that. I was hoping just you would say that. Everything makes me feel, I just, right, in right. life, just. The nice thing is that David can never let a real moment last <laughs> because of his horrible insecurities, his anger and his bitterness. He has to comment even when things go well. <laughs> That's what drove him to his life of crime. <laughs> <laughs> Simply safe. I love those commercials. They're just so good. Oh, all safe. right. That's, that's, that's a perfect place to end it. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. I really do. I love you guys a lot. And thank you for having me on this. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you, Russell. Such, thank such you, Russell. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Russell. Great job. Really well done. No, thank you. It, it, it's an honor. To, it was great to, to be, watch those clips. It's I didn't an like, honor to I didn't be like what David Feldman said, but otherwise, I thought it was a good. <laughs>